Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Casey. It is a pleasure to be back before you again. Just as a quick overview, we're gonna go over um, a few updates as, as regards to COVID-19. Uh, particularly, I'll be talking a little bit about the workforce and where we stand in regards to COVID-19 preparation and what we're doing. Um, I'm also um, happy to report that I have two colleagues here um, from, the, from VDH, Chesterfield Health District. Um, Dr. Alexander Samuel will be my co-presenter, and he is also supported here by Brad Porter, who is the district epidemiologist. Um, and lastly, you will hear from um, our very own fire chief, Chief Center, um, who will give a fire EMS county government update. Let's talk a little bit about the general workforce. Um, as you know, the virus doesn't appear to be leaving us anytime soon. Employers are taking measured steps um, all across uh, this nation, uh, particularly here in, in Virginia. And likewise, Chesterfield is no different. Here's what we're doing to continue providing excellent customer service while protecting those that serve. One, adopting additional work models. First and foremost, the Chesterfield County continues to focus on customer service while allowing departments the ability to stagger and rotate work schedules and employees to keep appropriate spatial distancing as one method to reduce the spread of COVID-19 in the workplace. Like many employers may have done, the county created an official remote work policy effective July 1, which offers the departments the flexibility to determine a work model that allows the seamless customer service while meeting the safety needs of the workforce. Because of the varied work performed by the county employees, we identified five work arrangements, one on site only. These are employees that work on site only, of course. Uh, next hybrid eligible. These individuals have opportunity to work on site or remotely. Contingent remote. These are individuals that based on their job function, it may be contingent for them to work on site or off site. Temporary remote. They may be working only partial times as, as uh, temporary as projects will allow. Uh, field operations allow these individuals that are working directly in the field and may not have the opportunity to work remotely. Have been implemented and are working well. In regards to ongoing COVID work, the Employee Medical Center continues to provide COVID illness testing, treatment, um, return to work clearances, and monitoring as we anticipate a continuous spike in positive COVID cases. Continuing monitoring and updating of the county issue guidance for appropriate workplace policies regarding quarantines and work and returning to work. As it relates to COVID vaccinations, uh, continuing employee vaccination clinics for initial vaccinations are being held the EMC is adding vaccine clinics to provide a third dose for the immunocompromised and practically uh, planning for possible booster doses for the general workforce population. Uh, coordination and partnering with the Chesterfield County Public Schools nursing staff to assist in taking care of schools workforce um, is also ongoing. Most recently, the county administrator uh, provided guidance to employees, one, while employees are not required to wear masks, it is strongly encouraged when spatial distancing is not possible. We will continue to create spatial workplaces um, or have plexiglass or other barriers set up to enable employees to perform work functions more safely. Um, thirdly, for those that can telework, employees are encouraged to utilize the option without sacrificing service or productivity. Uh, similarly, uh, how we have done in, in the, over the past year, quite frankly. Employees must continue to perform their daily self-assessment of health and be aware of any symptoms that would require avoiding the workplace and seeking a COVID test. And lastly in this category, public safety departments, other 24-hour operations, and certain public-facing services are continuing to work with risk management to determine the best manner in which to incorporate these work safety practices and daily protocols. And like always, accommodations are also made as appropriate for customers and employees. <clears throat> the county continues to put measures in place that will aid in reducing risk or of exposure to the virus for our customers and employees, uh, just as we've done since again, the beginning of the pandemic. For those that may be interested in uh, taking a look at uh, resources that are available here in Chesterfield County, um, I will invite you to come to chesterfield.gov forward slash 
uh, COVID. There you might be able to sign up to receive COVID text notifications, information on the vaccine finder where you can find the nearest pharmacy or a location to get your vaccine, um, access to free rides uh, to COVID vaccination appointments, as well as taking a look further at our Chesterfield County vaccination dashboard, which you will see a little bit more of that uh, during Chief Senate's presentation. Without further delay, at this time, I invite Dr. Alexander Samuel, Director of the Chesterfield Health District, to come forward to provide further information regarding COVID update. Good afternoon and welcome, Dr. Samuels. It's always good to see you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Worsley. Mr. Holland, members of the board, uh, Dr. Casey, I'm here to provide you with a brief update on the COVID-19 situation here in Chesterfield County, focusing more on epidemiology and public health updates. So I'll start with some basic trend data and statistics. Since early July, we've been seeing our daily COVID case counts trending upward at a fairly steep pace. Our team of epidemiologists has been opening between 140 and 170 new cases every day over the past week. The nature of increase is similar to what we saw last winter when we saw the largest spike in case numbers. Looking at the statistics data in the table at the bottom of the slide, even though the number of new cases we're seeing has been fairly striking, the hospitalization and death rates are still low. We'll need to continue to monitor these indicators as both death and hospitalization rates lag behind case rates by several weeks. So the concept of community transmission is one way public health officials try to quantify the presence of an infectious disease and the potential risk of an uninfected person contracting the disease. For COVID-19, the CDC uses two measurements to describe the presence of the COVID virus in a community. The first of these measures is the total number of new cases per 100,000 persons in the latest seven-day period. The second measure is the percentage of PCR tests that were positive during the latest seven-day period. At the end of July, Chesterfield County officially achieved the designation of having a high level of community transmission after crossing the threshold value of having greater than 100 new COVID cases per 100,000 persons for a seven day period. As noted in the table at the bottom of the slide, we currently have a value of 248 new cases. Our case rates and percent positivity values are comparable to those seen in the central healthcare region of the state. You'll notice that most of the Commonwealth is showing high levels of community transmission. All, pretty much every locality is in red. On July 27th, the CDC recommended universal masking in indoor public spaces regardless of vaccination status in areas with substantial or high community transmission due to the increases in cases largely attributable to the Delta variant of the virus. So the Delta variant is headline news now. Uh, variant virus strains develop from mutations in the original form of a circulating virus. Mutations can change characteristics of the virus, including tweaks that can make them spread from person to person more easily or by making them more potent. Strains that can outcompete the original or other variant strains because they are more transmissible eventually become a predominant strain. Non-competitive strains typically disappear. Right now, there are four variants that have been designated variants of concern in the US which means that they spread more quickly and easily than other variants, leading to more cases of COVID-19. These variants can create an increased strain on healthcare resources, lead to more hospitalizations, and potentially lead to more deaths. The variants of concern include those designated as alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. The delta variant was first identified in India early this year. The delta variant is different because it is highly contagious, more than twice as contagious as the other variants. There's also data suggesting that the Delta variant might cause more severe illness in unvaccinated individuals. Beyond this, we're seeing evidence that some fully vaccinated people who become infected with this variant can spread the virus to others. The graph at the bottom of the slide shows the growing predominance of the Delta variant over time as noted in surveillance sampling being conducted in the central region of the state. 
The left side of the graph shows the preeminence of the alpha variant in the early part of this year, so starting in January, in January in the far left. And then the appearance of the Delta variant in late April, then the eventual takeover by the Delta variant by August through outcompeting the other variant types. VDH conducts surveillance testing to monitor the variants of concern, which means that a proportion of all the positive COVID-19 tests conducted undergo an additional specific test to classify variant type. There is no specific test for the Delta variant at this time. The Delta variant, along with all the other variants, is detected through a process called whole, whole genome sequencing, which can identify the mutations that are associated with the specific type of variant. As already noted, the Delta variant is by far and away the most common. One CDC model estimates that the Delta variant accounts for 98% of the circulating strains in the Mid-Atlantic region earlier this month. I want to briefly provide some information that describes the benefits of getting fully vaccinated. So the top graph compares the rate of COVID infections in individuals who are unvaccinated. Uh, that's the line in yellow, partially vaccinated in blue, and fully vaccinated, uh, the line in black, starting in early 2021 through early August. Unvaccinated individuals developed COVID-19 at a rate 12.5 times higher than fully vaccinated people, and two and a half times higher than partially vaccinated people. This information is available on the VDH website and shows similar rate comparisons demonstrating the protective benefits of full COVID vaccination against hospitalization and death. The bottom table shows data describing the extent of vaccine breakthrough in the Commonwealth from mid-January through mid-August. A COVID-19 vaccine breakthrough infection is when a person tests positive for the virus 14 days or more after receiving the second dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine or a single dose of Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Even though vaccine breakthrough is occurring in fully vaccinated individuals, the proportion is small relative to the total number of people who are fully vaccinated in the state. In most cases, people with breakthrough infections have either no symptoms or mild symptoms, and their symptoms are usually shorter in duration than infections in unvaccinated individuals. Most importantly, as demonstrated by the data, fully vaccinated people are well protected against hospitalization and death. Dr. Samuel, can I yes, ask you a question on that? Because that's sure. the part that's always that's sort of the mystery to me is um, how we're capturing that data. Because it seems like there's probably a lot of vaccinated folks who may have such mild symptoms they don't ever get tested, right? right? So is it just, again, this sampling that they're doing to be able to capture this data in an accurate Correct. fashion? Yeah, so it is entirely dependent on having the tests and the test results available. So. There probably is a population who we're not being able to accurately record in terms of breakthrough infection. Because, because it's so mild or the symptoms Correct. are really... Correct. You know, they're Could just really a carrier that are not here. symptomatic at all, right? Right. right. Oops, I'm going back. So following the scale back from the large vaccination clinics at the Chesterfield County Fairgrounds, the health department established the Rockwood Vaccination Center at the corner of Courthouse and Hull Street Roads. By opening this location, we continue to offer COVID vaccinations to the general public, and particularly the under underserved populations of our communities. At the same time, health district leadership formed a COVID community response team to oversee our vaccination operations and two other vital areas that are aimed at vulnerable communities. In addition to a vaccination branch, the COVID response team oversees an outreach branch whose objectives are to interface with local businesses, faith-based organizations, and community gatekeepers to provide information about the public health resources that we offer at the health department, COVID vaccination and testing opportunities, and to serve as a listening ear to the concerns of the public related to COVID-19. Since early July, we have been sending teams of community health workers into parts of the district with lower vaccination rates. These teams have been canvassing businesses and going door to door in certain neighborhoods. In addition to the vaccination and outreach branches, the response team has a communications and education branch that develops and shares helpful information to the public. 
supporting the entire COVID community response team as a data support branch because our aim is to accurately focus our COVID response efforts in the areas of greatest need, this branch assists through analysis of, of available data from both DDH and locally generated sources. The goal is to direct our efforts where they're most needed and likely to have the greatest impact. Dr. Samuel. Yes. Question. Uh, so the FDA announced its approval, was that Monday of this week? Correct. Right. Um, I guess so it's probably too soon to know if we're seeing any increase uh, numbers coming into these clinics to get vaccinated. I know uh, just anecdotally, some folks had mentioned they were waiting for that approval, but I didn't know if you all had seen any sign of that, uh, that number creeping up as a result of that. Yeah, we're, we're hopeful, <laughs> but don't have any. I don't have any anecdotal, uh, you know, stories to indicate that that has happened yet. You know, we have uh, the operation at a Rockwood uh, vaccination clinic, which has been, um, you know, I, I wouldn't say uh, especially outstanding in terms of demand. Uh, we've seen it creep up some as we've seen the Delta variant appear, um, but it will be interesting to see if we're, we're, we're seeing the FDA approval spur more people to get vaccines. But I can't answer that question yet, Mr. Winslow. All right, I'll close by providing some recent updates and point to what we expect to see down the road. Pending final authorization from the FDA and other federal bodies, it's expected that anyone who has received two doses of an mRNA vaccine will be eligible to receive a booster dose due to evidence of waning immunity, particularly against mild to moderate illness. Individuals will be eligible to receive a booster dose at least eight months after receiving their second dose of either Pfizer or Moderna vaccine. We're expecting boosters to be available in Virginia during the week of September 20th. The booster dose will be the same amount and type of vaccine as the first two doses that fully vaccinated people have already received. On August 13th, the CDC recommended that people who are moderately or severely immunocompromised receive a third dose of Pfizer or Moderna vaccine at least 28 days after receiving their second dose of vaccine. Sometimes people who are immunocompromised do not build enough protection when they, get a first when they first get vaccinated. When this happens, getting another dose of the vaccine can help them build up more protection against the disease. The CDC website provides guidance about what conditions make one eligible for a third dose. The best advice to those who might have questions about their eligibility would be for them to consult a healthcare provider. We're still waiting for additional data to determine whether additional doses are recommended for individuals who receive J&J &J vaccine. Guidance is expected within the next few weeks. Uh, on August 23rd, the FDA granted full licensure of the Pfizer vaccine for those who are 16 years of age and older. The vaccine will now be marketed under the brand name Comirnaty and will still be available under the emergency, authoriz emergency use authorization for individuals 12 to 15 and as a third dose in immunocompromised individuals. There's a very strong COVID-19 vaccine delivery network in this health district that we expect will be able to handle what will be a rolling demand among those who are seeking a booster dose, mirroring the phases of those who received the initial doses of vaccines starting late last year and early this year. We're in regular communication with most of these vaccine providers and many are preparing for an increase in demand. We're also looking for ways to increase our capacity to provide vaccinations to the public, more than likely, primarily through booster dose clinics at our Rockwood Vaccination Center. There will naturally be some wait and see here but we're in a far different place than where we were during the initial vaccine rollout early this year. Finally, we have a strong collaborative relationship with Chesterfield County and have already begun the appropriate touch points to jointly monitor the situation and develop plans of action if course correction are required. Thank you very much and I'm available for any questions you might have. Thank you. Any questions to Dr. Mr. Chairman. Um, with relation to uh, the vaccines for kids, where do you know where we are on that uh, conversation nationally and yeah. sort of um, in terms of timelines? I know that uh, some are anxious to see that. Uh, I think it's 12 and up period uh, tr a trial sort of get extended downward to, um, I don't know, is it right. four, five? Five, five, five to 11. Five, five to 11, five 11 yeah. yeah. Do you know what the timeline is of that right now? Yeah, so I know 
different vaccine companies, um, Pfizer has recently announced that they have some fairly compelling data to indicate that they have a, a, a dose uh, of their vaccine that will have effectiveness in that five to 11 year old age range. Of course, all of this has to go through uh, federal approval processes. Um, my understanding is that uh, this data will be made available towards the end of September and then uh, that approval process has to, to be engaged. Uh, don't have any indication of when those vaccines will be available. That's still left to the federal government to decide. Another question. In terms of the spread of the Delta variant, are you seeing um, sort of a similar pattern of spread uh, that we saw previously in terms of congregatory settings, settings being the, the most uh, troublesome uh, venue for that spread? Yep, I, I think that's probably a very fair assessment. There are probably two kind of locations with quotation marks, if you will. So one would be those congregate settings, just primarily because of it being so transmissible. It's very, very easy to, to spread that virus. I mean, uh, some public health folks are comparing it to chickenpox, which is a, an easily spread uh, virus. That, that other kind of situation is, um, you know, we're seeing individuals who have no idea how they got it. And so that, that is another kind of hallmark of uh, a very highly transmissible virus. So it's those two general categories, we're seeing it in congregate settings, uh, daycares, et cetera. Um, um, and, and so, yes, we're continuing to monitor that, that situation. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I have a question. Yes, Mr. Carroll. Uh, Dr. Samuels, thank you for coming up today. We, I had sent you a list of questions earlier and you were kind enough to respond back to them, but I still didn't see the data that I had asked for, and maybe you can speak to this. Um, how many uh, Delta variant tests are we actually being conducted? Because, I, I mean, I think we're, the perception from some people in the community now is that, that everything is Delta and, and nothing else. Yeah. COVID is COVID, right? But uh, my understanding is that there's a different test that needs to be done to, to verify that it is uh, the Delta variant. So if you could explain to the community what that test is like, and then if you have numbers as to how many we're actually testing and how we're coming to our conclusions, I think that would be helpful for the community at large. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah that's a good question. So with regard to um, talking about Delta being the most predominant variant, and that's that is because um, the, the nature of kind of understanding its presence is, is done primarily through a process called surveillance testing. And that's taking uh, samples of tests. Um, right now, uh, the, the tests that are being run through the state lab, which is a, a fair number of tests, usually through health departments uh, and other entities that use the state lab for that purpose, are all being uh, tested, uh, all the positive tests are being subjected to a second test, uh, which is that whole genome process, whole genome sequencing process that I mentioned earlier. And all that does is, is pretty much determine um, the nature of the variant. So it can identify alpha, beta, uh, delta, et cetera. And so um, that does not account for all the tests that are being conducted. You know, tests are being conducted through private uh, entities, uh, hospital systems, et cetera. But it is that subsample of tests that are going through the state lab, and I, I don't have a, a really good sense of what proportion that is of overall tests. Now, the value of the tests that are going through the state lab is that they're being collected from all over the state. So you have sort of a pooled, uh, sort of homogenized subsample of all tests. And it's there that there is that indication of, through whole genome sequencing, uh, by far and away, the vast majority are delta variant um, positives. Uh, the, the challenge with uh, kind of identifying that at the local level is simply the number of positives, I guess you would say, that, that can be attributed to a given locality and then applying a, um, a process to kind of clearly state whether, uh, you know, that, that, that is dis absolutely descriptive of locality. There simply aren't enough uh, uh, test numbers to be able to say, uh, you know, 90% of the tests in Chesterfield County are of the Delta variant. Um, that's a question I posed to folks at the, uh, the, the state epidemiology office, and um, you know, they, they were pretty careful in the way they replied, pretty much indicating that we simply don't have 
enough test data at any locality to provide useful um, data about Delta variant prevalence at the local level. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Like to right. we appreciate. Sure. Thank you. Welcome, Chief. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the board, Dr. Casey. Just very briefly, we'll revisit the uh, vaccination dashboard <laughs> developed by Captain Brian Warshawski in collaboration with Natalie Spillman and Trip Ray. As you can see from the graph, uh, Chesterfield is near the center of the pack in vaccination efforts among the top 10 localities in the Commonwealth by population. At this point, we're at 97.56% uh, of reaching our goal of having 75% of the eligible population vaccinated with at least one dose. When you drill down a little further, uh, among the age groups that are at most risk for hospitalization and death, we now have over 91% of those 70 years of age and older vaccinated, and nearly 83% of those 60 to 69 years of age who are vaccinated. While we're doing much better among the younger populations as compared to other states, uh, we continue to fall short in our goal in vaccinations among those 20 to 39 years of age. These are age groups that continue to account for a large number of cases in the community, especially among the unvaccinated. Finally, um, just taking a look at uh, hospitalizations, death, and cases, as um, Dr. Samuel has indicated that uh, we are seeing uh, a spike. Um, we haven't seen such a spike since um, December January of, of this year. Um, the spike that we're experiencing right now is pretty consistent with what uh, began in November of 2020. And so time will tell if that trend continues in the future. Um, as Dr. Samuel mentioned, uh, the deaths uh, at this point are, are remaining relatively low in comparison. Uh, however, the data for death reporting is uh, delayed sometimes um, perhaps weeks or up to a month. So time will tell if that, that um, pattern stays the same, but we're hopeful that with all the vaccinations that we have out there, um, our chances of keeping hospitalizations and um, deaths low will, will be effective. Um, while we don't have direct patient census data from the hospitals, we do know that our hospitals are stressed. They are seeing an increase in COVID patients, but more importantly, they're also seeing an increase in higher acuity patients for conditions other than COVID. And those factors coupled with a severe staffing shortage among nurses is really driving many hospitals to be overwhelmed. And um, very often hot, the ambulances are being diverted to other hospitals, not for the choice of the patient, but for reasons that there aren't beds available. And we're having to drive longer distances to other areas. And so to give you an example, the hospitals in Central Virginia are in their 10th consecutive day of being what we call a code black diversion status in accordance with our regional diversion protocols, which means that eight or more hospitals are in some similar states of diversion. We continue to work with the hospitals with our Old Dominion, Old Dominion EMS Alliance on some strategies to uh, mitigate some of these effects, particularly on our local EMS systems, and we'll continue to work with the hospitals as we go into the future. But my closing message to the public, if you are not vaccinated and you're sitting on the sidelines, please, please, please consider getting vaccinated. That is your best bet to prevent serious illness and death and prevent um, affecting those around you and your loved ones and making room in those hospitals for those patients for other reasons who have significant needs for care. So that concludes my comments, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you, Chief. Any questions, comments? Now I can just tell you it's a, it's a little scary to hear what the statistics are, um, just, you know, the staffing issues and things that lead to this. So I think we just I appreciate the update and anything you can do to keep us always informed of that and anything we can do to assist as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you, Dr. Worsley, as well, for bringing us up to date. And a great message to the community, Chief, thank you, to practice, again, masks and, of course, get vaccinated. By all means, get vaccinated. Thank you for that message to the community. Mm -hmm.